Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you've been sitting in the back row and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button and then making sure your notifications are set to all. That way you don't miss every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you can buy me a coffee. Or if you'd like to learn about membership to Back to Ashes, all that can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So, this happened about 20 years ago, when I was a young 15-year-old girl. I had an older neighbor who taught drums and was a friend of my family's, and I would take drum lessons from him once a week. He only lived like two and a half blocks away, so I would always walk, and he and his family lived at the end of the cul-de-sac. Well, one summery day, when I was walking home at like 4 p.m., broad daylight in a quiet neighborhood, there was a strange man standing across from the end of the cul-de-sac. He had on a big cowboy hat, odd for my area, and some facial hair. I don't know, he was maybe in his 30s, and he was just staring at me. He was watching me unabashedly as I walked down the cul-de-sac and then crossed the street. And once my back was to him, I could hear that he was following me. My heart sped up. My drumsticks seemed like weak protection, and I was wearing these thin little flip-flops. And remember thinking, if I had to kick him, they weren't going to help me at all. Less than half a block away from me was a more busy street, and I remember thinking, if I could just get to that street where people would see, he'd be sure to back off. But his steps sounded closer, and I could taste my panic knowing I wasn't going to make it. I ended up running up a house where I kind of knew the family, and I knew a mom and young kids were probably there. And I pounded on her door. I tried to open it myself, even in my panic. She opened it, and I spilled into her house and locked the door. I told her what had happened and let my heart calm down a little. After being inside for like 15 minutes, I asked if I could just hop her back fence to go home, since it would cut out a block of travel. But when we slid back the drapes of her back door, the dude was leaning against the fence, right outside her house, where he could see both the front and back door. She ended up loading her kids into the car and driving me home, and later had her husband ask around. Turned out, the dude was living with his mother and had just gotten out of jail. I don't know the charges. All I know was that my stomach had been twisted into knots, and it wasn't the first time I tasted fear like that. I don't know what would have happened if he would have caught me. So, creepy ex-prisoner, let's not ever meet again. Back in community college, I rode the bus to and from college. Bus stop was walking distance to my house, so it was a huge help for me. When I'm on the bus, I always listen to music and look outside. Never at my phone. Never at anyone else. Guess that's how I never noticed the man always looking at me. One day, I went to go to the computer to shit posting memes and chat with my boyfriend through Facebook. This dude pulls up a chair, sits right next to me, looking at my memes and says, Hi. Dude startled me immediately. He was like, Hey, beautiful. Thought I'd finally come by and say hi. I see you on the bus a lot and thought you might want some company, you know. 
I responded, even though my hair was fucked up, nose congested, and sleepy as hell. Um, who are you? I'm whoever the fuck it was, and I think you're pretty. Um, I have to go to class now. Leaves, but not heading to class in case he follows me. He follows me, then turns around for a bit and leaves. After college, the dude shows up at my bus stop at the exact time my class ends and waits for me. Says the same stuff as last time. He repeats this for about a week until I finally tell the bus driver. This dude is following me and it's creeping me out very much. Me and the bus driver are cool. Bus driver closes the door and drives off, leaving behind creepy fucker before he could get on. Creepy dude started telling his classmates how he is going to get laid soon. Only reason I know this is because one of the classmates is my best friend. I pointed out to him who my creepy stalker was, and my friend told me that he keeps talking about attempting to hook up with a chick and maybe he will get laid soon. In your fucking dreams, bitch. I cussed him out next time he appeared at the end of my class, saying he was, Sorry, baby, I won't do it again. You dumbass, I'm not your baby. Fuck off or I'll call the police. I'm serious. I don't even know who the hell you are. Cool teacher hears our conversation and has a discussion with him privately. After that, he now leaves me alone. Guy becomes a stalker and then starts trying to call me as his girlfriend. Yeah, dude. Whatever. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and was studying in Paris, France. I was going home from uni. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way. That day, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking intensely at me. I was used to unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like prey being stalked. I decided to get off the bus a few stops early. I wanted to avoid him and didn't want him to see where I usually got off. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button and waited until the last moment to stand up and leave. I didn't notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was feeling the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I look over my shoulder, and there he was, a few meters behind me. I had the distressing feeling his eye had just looked away the moment I turned. I walked into a shop, took my phone, and pretended to be taking a call. When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited and made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back in the busy street. I zigzagged across that street at every crossing. Finally, I believed that man getting off at the same stop with me was just a coincidence. When I reached my building, I looked back one last time, and there he was his alarming gaze on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbing the stairs four at a time. I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, and locked it. I was frozen. My intercom started ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed all the buttons one by one, hoping someone would open. But now he knew my name. Gabriel? Ah, shit. I felt like a deer in the headlights, frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just want to talk to you. Somehow I couldn't move or speak. Come to the window, he added. Look at me. You'll see, I'm not a bad guy. Something clicked. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. I was not going to make that mistake. I hung up in shock. 
I waited by the door without moving for what seemed like hours. Well, I finally managed to calm myself. I called my long-distance boyfriend. Call the police, he said immediately. Why didn't I call the police? I don't know. Today, it would be the first thing I would do. The fear of making a big deal out of something not important and perhaps. What an idiot I was. I called my best friend instead. I didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while, I felt better. I felt safe. We started laughing. Suddenly, the intercom rang again. Two hours had passed since I'd come home. I answered. Gabriel, said the voice. Please open. I still remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He was there all this time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabriel, let me in. I'm so thirsty, he says. Just give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. Curled up in a corner, literally in recovery position, terrified. I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared to even breathe. The intercom rang again, and again, and again. I didn't answer this time. I crouched to the sofa and fell asleep from exhaustion. I heard the intercom ring one more time in the middle of the night. I woke up in the morning, afraid to leave my apartment. I called my dad, who came to pick me up. There was no one in the hall, but there was a note in my mailbox. Gabriel, I'm a nice guy. You should have opened to me. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened and, of course, told me that I should not hesitate to call them. My dad called a locksmith to install digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors asking to not open the door to anyone they didn't expect. He sat in the cafe in front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. I never saw my stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from uni every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand and looked back every few meters. Today, I am still very observant of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I'm not expecting someone. So people, if you ever find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be an idiot like me. Be safe out there, everyone. This was back in October of 2018 when I had accompanied my mom to a clinic in a small town about an hour away from Frankfurt. I'm in my late 20s and female. We were there for about two weeks while my mom underwent treatment for cancer. Unfortunately, soon after arriving, she experienced a lot of pain in her leg and we later found out that the cancer had spread there and her leg could break at any wrong step. This meant that if I was going to see anything, I had to go alone. This was fine as the town we were in was extremely small and filled mostly with the old and sick. There was a larger town only about a mile away up and over a fairly steep hill and a large park in between. It was about noon and my mom wasn't going to need me to be around, so I decided to go for a walk around the park. To get there, I just had to walk down the path, cross the street, lined with inns and cafes on the side leading to the park. There are twisting paths crisscrossing over each other, a lot of benches, a couple fountains, and one or two community buildings. I chose a path that would take me right beside an underground fountain about as deep as my shoulders, I'm 5'7", with steps leading down to the spout. It was there I first saw 
him. I was heading almost directly toward the fountain when a man's head pops up, looking directly at me. I looked back at him for a second, thinking I had surprised him just as much, and we'd do the normal look-away-quickly thing. I was the only one who looked away. When I looked back, I realized he was still watching me, and then I noticed he had one arm crossed over his chest and moving, as though he was touching himself. As soon as I realized this, I looked away and changed my direction to give him a wide berth. I was so stunned and in disbelief that I convinced myself that whatever he was doing had nothing to do with me, and that as long as I kept walking, he'd go back to being weird all by himself. I turned down a path that, for the immediate area, was wide open. I was still close to the cafes and inns, and the occasional other person also taking a midday walk. I was almost to an area that would take the path through patches of woods, which would also take me out of the public eye. When I looked back to see if the guy was still in the fountain, he was gone. Surprised, I quickly did a circle and noticed he had taken off, doing a wide loop that left a lot of opportunity for us to cross paths again if I didn't change directions. Once again, I couldn't believe it. I thought it's the middle of the day, we're in a quiet but not unpopulated town about a mile away from a larger one. There's no one here but old and sick people. There's no way a predator would be here. Now hunting me, but I still stopped and decided to change directions again. This time, my dumbass decides to take a tiny path that would lead me to the base of the hill that would go over to the larger town and was heavily wooded. I get up to where the trees started and decide to look again. That's when I noticed that he had also changed his direction and was practically jogging away from me. I looked back up the path and know where it led. I had a fairly good idea that the path this guy was jogging up would eventually connect to the path in the woods, because they all did. So I stood at the end of the path and waited until the guy was out of sight. Before I turned around and headed in the opposite direction, through the grass of pretty wide open portions of the park. I got to where I was at a safe distance away and pulled out my phone to start recording myself. I figured it would just look like I was also video chatting with someone. This was when I was shown, without a doubt, that this guy was after me because not long after I make it across the park, but to where I could still see the path up the hill, he comes down the very same path, looking side to side, looking for me. He eventually spots me again. I had very bright, dyed red hair and was pretty easy to spot in such a wide open area. It's at this point I feel safe enough because there are people nearby and I'm within running distance of the town should this guy book it towards me that I keep wandering around, testing to see how far this guy will go. He keeps following me, tries to stay out of sight, because at one point I turn around suddenly and watch him sprint back into some trees, until eventually I go up a hill that has zero cover for him to use and I lose track of him. I continued on to explore a different small town, making sure I'm always in a public space and easily seen. But I never saw him again. Trust your gut. My head was telling me there was no way this could be happening to me, and I almost tested it by walking up into the woods. But my gut screamed, bad idea, and I couldn't be more relieved. I listened. So, moral of the story, and a message to you, always trust your gut. So this is a story of something that happened to me and some friends when I was in high school. I think I was in grade 10. Me and three friends were smoking behind a school. 
The school was about a 45-minute walk away from the neighborhood where we all lived. It was a small high school town in Ontario, California. It contained two large high schools and a bunch of small, medium-sized elementary and middle schools. It's common knowledge that with every small town, when you were young, that the main problem is that there is nothing to do within it except party and run around the streets acting like idiots. And that's what we did most of the time. But I went through a phase when I was 13 to 15 years where I just went to parks and schools with friends and just smoked and or drank. This particular night was just to smoke. In the middle of our session, a car pulled up around back of this middle school we were smoking at. A man got out of the car and started walking towards us. It was dark enough and the car was far enough away that we couldn't make out faces. But as 14 to 15 year old kids, we thought it was an adult coming to bust us for smoking. So naturally, we ran away through a field over a fence up a small street with a few houses and back onto the main road that would lead us home. This was the main road that ran in the middle of the entire town. As we were walking down this main road on the sidewalk, we passed a convenience store on the right-hand side. This was at one point the only convenience store in town that sold candy. Cheap, assorted, five-cent-per-piece candy. We used to always come to this store as younger kids to buy that candy. So we were very familiar with this part of town at this point in our lives. So we treaded along with confidence, not even thinking twice about the person that we just ran from. In our town, this was a normal occurrence. We were teenagers, loitering, and someone was coming to tell us to go away. So we did. End of story? Nope. Just as we were walking by Daisy Mart, that's the name of the convenience store with the five cent candies, headlights from that car lit up and blinked at us from an alley way in between a concrete wall and the convenience store. The ignition started and the car sped up towards us with considerable speed, so we ran out of its way. We looked back and realized it was the same car from the school. The car pulled out of the convenience store alley, but it turned the opposite direction of which we were walking. We thought it was just creepy and just a coincidence, but about 10 minutes later, the same car drove past us, and from tinted windows, we heard someone in the car say, We're still coming for you and it drove off, past us, up the road, and out of sight. We were a little freaked out at this point, so we hurried along. The main road we were on eventually turned into a pretty sizable bridge which loomed over a small river and a pretty large forested area. On occasion in local news, you'd hear about children getting lost in these forested areas, so it wasn't small by any means. So we all agreed to head under the bridge and take refuge to throw the guys who were following us off of our tail. So we hung out under the bridge, probably for about 30 minutes, talking, smoking, and mildly shaken up, but pretty much laughing it off. This was creepy to us, but nothing to be alarmed about. As mentioned, we were kids in a small town. We were used to getting up to no good and having a run from authority. This was just another day, it seemed. Our confidence was overinflated. We never got caught. We lived in an area with so many small connecting streets and parks. Running and hiding after creating mischief was something that came second nature. We confidently headed back to the bridge to continue our walk home after the mentioned time. Now, to explain this bridge, it was a long bridge, four lanes, two going in either direction, no room for a car to stop and wait, no designated parking lanes. It was somewhat of a mini highway. The bridge is also steep, so the middle of the bridge, which is also the area with the footpath that led to the forest, 
was the lowest point. There was absolutely no way any car could park anywhere on or near this bridge to idle and wait for us to come up from under the bridge. Not to mention that the car was nowhere in plain sight when we decided to go under it in the first place. But after two minutes of walking, the car came up from behind us and a man from inside the car said to us, You thought you can get away from us? We'll always find you. So the car took off once again, but we decided as well. Once we crossed the bridge, it led us back to our neighborhood. To stress the point once again, the neighborhood we lived in contained many connected streets and many sections of homes and parks. A pretty large suburban area. If you didn't know where you were going, you could probably get lost pretty easily. So we ran to the closest, biggest park where no cars would be able to get into. One street was visible from the park, but since it was in the middle of the night, if you were driving by the park, it would be hard to make out anyone in the park. So that's probably why when we saw the same car that had been following us drive by the park, it didn't stop this time. So since this park was literally in the middle of the neighborhood, we wished each other good luck and we all took off in different directions to our respective homes. We each only lived two minutes away at this point, so we all made it home safely. Not the creepiest story, but one I do like to share because no one got hurt. And looking back, it is a fun one to tell. Oh, P.S. I don't remember what the car looked like, so I didn't want to make it up, but I do remember at this time knowing the exact vehicle when we saw it and feeling the fear we felt after seeing each of the final two times. I think I have a stalker. Well, had one. I'm an Israeli high school student. I have long brown hair. I'm 179 centimeters tall, and I weigh 68 kilograms. That would be 5'11", 150 pounds for all you Americans out there. My encounter started in October of 2022 on a Jewish holiday called Yom Kippur. It translates to Day of Repentance. Basically, it's just a day when Jews go to the synagogue to repent for their sins, fast, and don't use any electricity. On Yom Kippur, teens usually go to the town square and just chill there, meet new people, and talk. So, being bored, I chose to go along with my peers in the hopes of meeting new people. Of these new people, I've met a girl. Let's just call her Emma. I met Emma through mutual friends. She goes to another high school in a different town and doesn't often stay in mine as her parents are divorced and her mom has custody of her in the other town, while her dad lives in the same town as mine. The best description of her is 150 centimeters tall and 50 kilograms soaking wet, or for the Americans, 411 and 110 pounds with this kind of fusion between ginger and blonde hair, an introverted triangle face shape, and she has this distinct, piercing look to her teal greenish eyes. We talked a bit. She was shy and socially awkward. I made up some bullshit excuse about my parents wanting me home, as it was getting late. Before I left, she asked for my Instagram. I'm fairly active on social media, mostly posting comedic stories, just low-effort jokes that people seem to like. I've noticed that she always views my stories first. Coincidence, maybe? But it seems to be seconds after I post them. I suspected maybe she had notifications on, but it was probably just my ego. She responded to a lot of them. She texted in a flirty kind of way, with a lot of heart emojis and as such, along with flirty, dirty sexts. I got a creepy vibe, but assumed she was just joking. Around December was the first time she tried to meet up with me. 
She persuaded me, but I don't crack under peer pressure, so I kept with the bullshit excuses. Around mid-January, she started texting me on WhatsApp. I never gave her my number, but it was safe to assume one of my mutuals gave it to her. A bit creepy, but whatever. There were a few phone calls that I missed because I was busy. She kept proceeding with the inappropriate jokes, and I started to ignore her more, usually responding with one-word answers to texts. She started to get pissy, but I hoped that just shutting her out will be the best way to proceed, as she will eventually get the hint. In February, she crossed the line. A big line. Out of the blue, she just texted me the name of my street and a number to try and throw her off my tail. I just responded with a question mark. She followed up by telling me, That's where you live. X, or a friend's name here, told me you're afraid of me. That's not true, is it? Being freaked the fuck out, I just left her on red, hoping everything will go away. In the meanwhile, I tried to figure out how she got that address. Following some digging online, it was the address that showed after searching for my father's full name, a name that I'd never told her. She texted me again a few days later, asking me to let her come over. I told her to leave me alone. She tried to convince me to take her out on a date. I told her I'm gay. She called me every homophobic slur in the book, some of which I've never heard, which was impressive. I told my friend about it, and he later sent me a screenshot of her private story showing her crying and talking about how all men are evil and the such, asking if this was related to me. It probably was. The following morning, she sent me a voice message from a different account, telling me how much she was sorry and that she just loves me. I told her again, I'm gay, you're nice and all, but I'm simply just not interested in you. Silence. Have I finally reached peace at last? It's been a few days without hearing from her, and all was good, and I quickly forgot of her existence. Around a week after the entire incident happened, my mom was supposed to drive me to school, but when we got in the car, we noticed a tire was punctured. I had a bad feeling about it. In hindsight, I realized that my dog barked manically the night before, but I assumed it was just me being delusional and that those were just coincidences. For the following days, I had a sinking feeling that something was wrong. I felt as if I was being watched when I was following routines, such as going to the gym or walking the dog. I thought I saw her at the mall, but there are only two malls in my town, so it's not that unlikely. She didn't seem to notice me. It was early March at that point, my birthday. A day before my birthday, I got a flower bouquet delivered to me along with balloons and a note saying, I love you. No clue from whom, but I didn't bother to ask the delivery guy, as I guessed those were just my friends fucking with me. They knew I was on edge, but now I'm not sure that it was them. For my birthday, I decided to get drunk with my friends. I take antidepressants, so I often don't get shit-faced when I'm drunk, only mildly drunk. The parents of my friends, who lives 20 minutes away, were on vacation, so he was the host. I posted some pics to my story of us just messing around in his front yard. We made too much noise and cops were called, so we had to cut it short. Walking back home, I felt paranoid. I get a bit worried when I drink, but I tried to ignore the thoughts. There was a woman who kept short distance behind me. But again, I ignored my gut and assumed it was a coincidence. I stopped on my walk and went into some shrubbery because I just had to barf. I felt my hair being pulled into a ponytail. It was the lady. She held my hair for me. She told me to sit down and to wait a bit before I continue. I listened to her and sat down cross-legged with my face looking down. 
I had my face down out of shame, and because I was afraid, I'll suddenly puke all over her if I raise my face up. I caught a few glimpses, and she seemed familiar. Her voice was soothing and oddly familiar. She was pretty touchy, but didn't overthink it as I was a bit out of my senses. She was getting a bit too touchy-filly and started moving her hand toward my nether regions, and I finally told her to stop. I look her in the face and tried to make her stop when suddenly I figured out who she was. I assumed I probably knew her as a neighbor or a peer. It clicked. It was Emma. The eyes gave her away. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. I was too dizzy. She touched my shoulder, and I slapped her hand away and told her to leave me alone. She put her hand under my chin, and that was it. I don't remember why, but I reflexively punched her. It was just one punch with the weak power of a drunk man, but a punch is still a punch. She backed off, and I just apologized and stumbled away. I cried on the walk home. I'm a pacifist. I'm strictly anti-violent. I've never punched another person, and it's strictly against my morals to punch a woman. I still feel guilt about it. I got a message from an unknown number telling me I'm a dead man. But ever since then, nothing happened. I'm still paranoid, guilty and disgusted by myself. It's nearly June and haven't heard from her since March. But I still can't let it go. So, Emma... Let's not ever meet again. I recently received a friend request that reminded me of this story, so I'm going to share it with you. This happened after I went to university, so I was 18. I made an effort to make friends after I moved on to campus and ended up with a few groups to hang out with including a new girlfriend and plenty of people from my classes that I liked well enough. There was one class before lunch, which it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards to eat in pairs or threes. I wasn't very discerning about who I'd have lunch with because I got on fine with most people from the class and we were all trying to make an effort to be social. So when one girl, Lily, asked if, I wanted to eat lunch together after that class. I didn't have any reason not to go. We talked about school and that kind of thing. Nothing noteworthy, but she did ask me to get lunch with her again the next week. It became a pattern, and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no suddenly. It was fine, but it didn't mean I lost the chance to eat lunch with anyone else on those days. In hindsight... I suppose that was the point. One day in class, I asked someone if I could add them on social media. This happened in front of Lily. I saw her face jerk towards me from a couple of seats over. It was such a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore, and I still remember it. By the time I got home later that day, Lily had sent me a friend request. No friends in common. Don't know how she knew my last name. I was a bit surprised, but I guess she just dug through the university's social media pages and found me through there, I guess. It gave me a bad feeling, but surely it was fine? She ended up messaging me a lot and commenting on anything I posted. I told myself that she was just awkward and we became friends. If not close, I'd known worse people. She still always got me to go to lunch with her after our one shared class. Other than that, we rarely spent time together in person. I saw her around sometimes, but I never went out of my way to hang out with her. So, it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other in group settings. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also called Lily. This was something that clearly bothered Lily, not my girlfriend, who couldn't have found it less interesting. That's a common name. 
She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name or joked about her not fooding it. She clearly didn't like my girlfriend at all, and I had no idea of why. It was hard to ignore by this point. Lily was starting to unsubtly hint that she had a crush on me. I tried not to address it because what was I going to say? I've never known what to do when a friend makes a pass at me. I was also not interested in her in the least, even ignoring the weird stuff she pulled. Lily was not my type at all. She tended to dress and act in a way somewhere between a 50s housewife and one of those adults who is still obsessed with Disney princesses, if you can picture that. Things took an uncomfortable turn on the day of our last shared class of the year. Instead of asking me to lunch like she usually did, Lily asked if I'd go for a walk with her. Again, I didn't exactly know how to refuse, so I said all right. Our campus was bordered by a large patch of woodland. Lily led me into the woods and the sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log and I joined her. She started talking about how she was going to miss me over the summer. I tried placating her, but I didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed almost on the verge of tears. I think I tried to make an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could leave, Lily chose to kiss me without warning. It was uncomfortable to say the least. I got out of there and was happy to think I wouldn't see her for a while. I came back to university after the summer, moving into a house with my friends. Without going off topic, there were some serious issues in my friend group, a lot of petty arguing and worse. I broke up with my girlfriend around the start of the school year as well, and basically the whole mess made me recontextualize things with Lily because it suddenly didn't seem so bad. That said, I didn't want to be alone with her. We mostly talked online. She was still constantly messaging me, after all. One upside of everything was that I started dating a boy. Lily was not pleased to hear that news. I think she hoped to sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend, but as I said... That was never going to happen. There wasn't a big gap between my breakup and this new relationship, so she must have thought she missed her chance to be with me. This is where the story gets bad. At this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I occasionally talked about my life and mostly reblogged photos and stuff. I was on there one day when something odd happened. One of the blogs I followed had received an ask with some phrases I recognized. It took a second to register that it was taken from my about page. That made me freeze. I read the message properly. Someone was asking this completely random person to analyze a section of text for my page, asking for their opinion on the type of person who would write it. I cannot stress how messed up it was to see people talking about me, like I was a character in a book they were trying to study. The reply was basically, I don't know, sorry. But the important thing was that the question hadn't been anonymous. It linked to someone's blog. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me. As far as I knew, no one in real life other than my boyfriend knew about my page. Well... No prizes for guessing who was behind it. What I found was like a shrine. She was using a fake name, and I recognized Lily all over that thing. It was this cutesy pink and red page. There were a few posts about her interests, but most of the context was focused on her primary interest, me. Most of the posts were about me, there were accounts of things I'd done recently. He told me about such and such. He went to a nightclub recently, etc. As well as reference to things from as far back as I'd known her. It was clear she had been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline. 
gathering up every scrap of information she could about my life and hoarding it here in her collection. She talked about us eating lunch together and how special our date had been to her, as if it was anything more than acquaintances getting food after class. She talked about the time she had forcibly kissed me in the woods, but she wrote it as if it had been mutual. She quoted lyrics from my favorite song and talked about how she'd always be there for me, no matter who else came into my life. Lots of references to loving me, just the way he is, which answered another mystery about an anonymous love letter I'd received earlier that year with the same wording. Oh, it got worse. There were a lot of posts about my boyfriend as well. These weren't so nice. They got vicious, talking about how he didn't deserve me. He didn't know what he had. If she was with me, she'd be jealous of anyone else who came near me. So my boyfriend not being a jealous person meant he didn't love me. It was angry and hateful. I didn't like to think about that sort of person who would write so obsessively being fixated on me. One thing that didn't make sense at first was that the blog also made plenty of references to Lily's best friend, Stephen. She had never mentioned this person to me. Her post talked a lot about Stephen and how great of a friend he was and how much fun they had had together, how he looked out for her, etc. I was trying to work out whether this was an online friend when one specific post made it all click. She had posted a photo and captioned it with, Stephen sent this to me. He knew I would like it and I love it, or something like that. The problem was, the photo was taken from my page. I hadn't sent that to her. She took it from my page and then claimed this fictional best friend of hers shared it with her because in her head, she'd split me into two people. In her messed up fantasy life, I was both the perfect best friend who was always looking out for her and her soulmate who was bound to end up with her when I finally got over my, sweet and kind, mind you, boyfriend and all the other easy girls I hung out with that she made dozens of posts complaining about. Who was she complaining to? Oh, Lily had an audience. She asked open questions about me and her relationship with me and got messages back from her followers, people who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of random people agreeing with this stalker that my boyfriend didn't deserve me and we were bound to break up soon so I could be with Lily. The person I was clearly supposed to be with. She had this fake fan fiction version of my life up for anyone to share their opinion on. And she'd made herself out to be the hero of it all. I went maybe a month back into the page's history. I didn't look at everything that was there. It was becoming too much. So I'm not sure how long this had been going on. I sent Lily a message confronting her about the blog. She said nothing. And I cannot stress how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me, with her talking about how she was in love with me and would make sure we ended up together, slamming my boyfriend and building a fantasy life with two different versions of me in it that she clearly believed to be real. Then, acting like it hadn't happened, she said nothing. She didn't address it. She just changed the subject, even after I pushed, and it was like she hadn't even registered what I said. I've never seen anything else like it. She deleted the page, of course, and at least changed the name and hid it so I'll never find it again. It wasn't the end, though. I wasn't going to hang out with her anymore but we were still shoved together in classes and she had started to actually scare me with what she might do next. I'm kind of a paranoid person knowing someone was obsessively keeping track of me for who knows how long. It really did freak me the hell out. 
The next thing she pulled was trying to seduce my boyfriend. It was an absolutely useless attempt that only made him uncomfortable. He told me about it right away. What was her plan there? Did she hope to tell me he would cheated and wait for me to break up with him? Why would I want her after all of that? When that didn't work for her, she tried hitting on three of my other friends. None of them took the bait. She ended up dating one of my former housemates for a while, but made sure to send me messages while they were together, letting me know she'd rather be with me. <laughs> no thanks. Lily made sure to stay in my life the whole time I was at university. There was a time when I tried to pull away from her, and she ended up starting rumors about me and damaging a career opportunity I'd put a lot of work into. I don't know what else she did behind my back, but it made me realize it was safer to let her think she was a part of my life while ignoring her, rather than doing something that would cause her to get angry. After I graduated, Lily still wanted to spend time together, but I knew I didn't have to now. I made excuses about work and barely talked to her after that point. I almost entirely stopped posting on social media that I knew she knew about. Of course, she didn't give up that easily. She tried to start conversations, asking me to meet up with her, attempts I usually ignored. I didn't like to think she was still tracking me online, but she probably was. I don't know how, but she'd occasionally reference things I mentioned online somewhere, somewhere she shouldn't have known about. The last time we had a real conversation, she sent me a message out of nowhere. We hadn't spoke at all in months and we hadn't talked about anything serious in much longer than that. Thinking about that conversation still makes my skin crawl, but I'll summarize what happened. At first, she asked me some questions about how long had I known I was a queer. I told her some basic stuff, the kind of thing I'd tell anyone who asked. Then she changed the subject. She started talking about how I would feel about her if she were a boy, about wanting to be a boy just for me. The messages quickly became fetishistic. She went into plenty of detail about fantasies she had of the two of us. Again, we were not friends at this point. We'd never been especially close, at least not from my perspective, and we had barely spoken for years. I can't imagine sending messages like that to even a close friend, let alone someone who barely knows you. I tried telling her not to pull this crap with me, but she decided to change tactics. She sent photos of herself, followed by a bunch of messages, maybe four or five a minute, way too fast for me to reply before the next one arrived basically quoting back what I had told her about myself and my past earlier. She was telling me things as if they had happened to her. She was role-playing as me. The worst part was she seemed to believe it was real, that those things actually happened to her, even when she was quoting me word for word. Things I'd told her only hours before, were now her life. It was like she was trying to absorb my history, to take it over, to make my life part of her. Yeah, I didn't talk to her again after that. I ignored future attempts she made to talk to me, and I eventually silently deleted her from the inactive social media, which was her only real way of contacting me. I really thought she might finally move on. A few days later, she sent me a friend request. It's sitting there unanswered, because I know if I delete it, she'll only send me another one. Lily and I met nearly 12 years ago. This story is just the highlight. And even then, it's only the stuff I know about for sure. A lot happened behind my back. I know it did. So... 
Girl who's spent 12 years obsessing over me, fetishing me, stalking me, and harassing me. Let's not meet again. The fantasy life you built for the two of us in your head is the only place you'll be seeing me anytime soon. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true stalker stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Of course, without you, there wouldn't be a me or a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.